Well, in the last episode, if you remember, we talked about a common cessationist argument that I call the rare miracle hypothesis. And I did my best to show you why that is a poor and irrational argument against the continuation of the gifts. And I told you that in this episode, we would be starting to get to the reason why I describe cessationism as heresy. Now, you're going to have to hang with me here because this is going to take at least the next couple of episodes to fully lay out. But I think that even by the end of the show today, you're going to already begin to see where I'm going with this. And in order to do this, we really need to talk a little bit about the history of modern cessationist doctrine. And I say modern cessationist doctrine because I think we need to distinguish what is being taught by guys like the cessationist teachers in that cessationist conference that motivated the series from more ancient forms of so-called cessationism. In fact, the two are so different from each other that I wish I had a different name for those more ancient forms. You might remember that in part two of the series, I read a comment from a listener that said, quote, congratulations, you just called all the reformers, the Puritans, and most of the church fathers heretics, end quote. Now, again, this is a commonly held belief, many people have, that cessationism is actually the orthodox position of the church historically. But that is misleading at best. Modern cessationist doctrine traces its origins not to the church fathers, but really back to the Enlightenment. And I say that because there are some distinct features of modern cessationism that make it fundamentally different from anything that came prior. And I'm going to show that to you, but I just need to make this more basic point first. Before the reformers came along, the church by and large still believed in the gifts of the spirit. Now, they would have certainly had some different ideas, you know, that set them apart from what charismatics believe today. But they weren't like modern cessationists at all. And honestly, this is very easy to prove. I mean, just think about it. Before the Reformation, the church with a capital C was basically either the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, right? And both of those churches embraced the gifts of the Spirit, and in fact, they still do to this day. I mean, look, in the Catholic Church, working miracles was one of the requirements for saints to be canonized. And they've been canonizing saints all along. So they obviously never believe the way that modern cessationists do. And in fact, one of the very reasons that the reformers rejected miracles was in an attempt to counter the Catholic Church. Now, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But maybe you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought the church fathers were cessationist. And if you know anything about the Catholic or Orthodox churches, you know that they put a lot of stock in the way that the church fathers interpreted scripture. So if that's the case, how could the church fathers have been cessationist and not pass that cessationism on to their successors? Well, this is the very misunderstanding that we need to talk about. The church fathers were not polemical cessationists. Now, when I talk about polemics, in case you're not familiar with the term, I'm talking about the kind of argumentation that is like aggressive, it's on the attack. I'm sure you've heard of apologetics. Apologetics are a kind of defensive argumentation, you know, defending what you believe against attack. Like it says, always be ready to give an answer for the faith that you have. But polemics are the opposite. They aren't defensive. They're offensive. They are on the warpath. In fact, that's what this series is. This series is a polemic against cessationism. And by the way, that's also what characterizes modern cessationism. Like those John MacArthur, Strange Fire, cessationist conference types, they are on the attack. They are going after charismatics and continuationists and what we believe in a polemic way. But you just don't find that in the teaching of the church fathers. They didn't have a systematic theological polemic that rejected the miraculous gifts. You could never imagine the church fathers having a, you know, cessationist conference, for example. So when people say that they were cessationist, you have to understand that basically they're referring to certain statements made by some of the church fathers that sounded cessationist, especially if you take them out of context and then interpret them through uh, a modern lens. But guys, you just can't do that. You can't project modern cessationist dogma onto the church fathers. You can't take their comments as support for an argument that they would have had no concept of and would have most certainly disagreed with. I was trying to think of how to illustrate this. But take, for example, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Paul tells us that he was a physician. Okay, so what if I said Luke was a doctor 
that means he was a man of science. That sounds reasonable, right? I mean, doctors are a kind of scientist, I suppose. And if Luke was a doctor and doctors are men of science, then it follows that Luke was a man of science, right? No, that's not accurate. Luke might have been a doctor in his time, but whatever medicine looked like back then, it wasn't scientific. The scientific method wasn't a thing yet. So projecting our modern concept of science and medicine onto a first century physician is anachronistic. And it's equally anachronistic to project modern concepts of cessationism onto the church fathers. They would have had no concept of the debate that we're having. And it's super easy to prove that they would have disagreed with modern cessationism if you just look at their writings. So that's what we're going to do now. I want to give you a little sampling here. And for anybody that knows anything about church history, this is probably going to be insulting to your intelligence because this stuff is so basic and so widely known. But amazingly, there are still people out there that don't know this stuff. And I know that's true because they keep leaving ignorant comments on my videos. So you have to realize here that I'm going to have to be very selective because there's so much to talk about. This could easily turn into a three hour podcast. And trust me, I've got enough content here. I could talk about this all day. And just so you understand, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to read all of these quotes in full, but I'll summarize them verbally and then I'll put the relevant excerpts along with citations on the screen for you so you can pause or come back later to read more. But let's just start here with the second century. So we're going pretty far back now to a guy named Justin Martyr. In his dialogue with Trifo, he says that the prophetic gifts were still in operation. And he says that there were women and men among them that, quote, possess gifts of the spirit of God, end quote. In his writing called The Second Apology of Justin, he said that demons are being cast out of numberless demoniacs by many of our Christian men. And he says that Christians in his time are exercising the gift of healing as well. Also, still in the second century, Irenaeus said that believers in his time were casting out devils. And he said that these delivered demoniacs were being joined to the church. He spoke of some who, quote, have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophetic expressions, end quote. He said that others were healing the sick through the laying out of hands, and even the dead were being raised. The dead were being raised. Does that sound like cessationism? He also testified that there were people who, quote, through the Spirit, speak all kinds of languages, prophesy, reveal secrets, and declare the mysteries of God. Now, actually, let me just read this whole excerpt because I think it's just too good to gloss over. Irenaeus says, quote, For some do certainly and truly drive out devils, so that those who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe in Christ and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands upon them and are made whole. Yea, moreover, as I've said, the dead even have been raised up and remained among us for many years. The dead are raised and remain among them for many years. Does that sound like cessationism? And in fact, in Against Heresies, he said, quote, it is not possible to name the number of gifts which the church scattered throughout the whole world has received from God in the name of Jesus Christ, end quote. And there's obviously a lot more that I could quote in the second century, but let's just keep moving. Let's go on to the third. The third century, you've got Origen in his eight volume work against Celsus. He says, quote, and some give evidence of their having received through this faith a marvelous power by the cures which they perform, invoking no other name over those who need their help than that of the God of all things and of Jesus, along with the mention of his history. For by these means, we too have seen many persons freed from grievous calamities and from distractions of mind and madness and countless other ills, which could be cured neither by men nor by devils, end quote. Does that sound like cessationism to you? In that same work, Origen contrasts Christianity with Judaism by making a very interesting argument. He basically says here that the Jews don't have the power of the spirit anymore, but the church does. Look at this. He says, quote, for they, let's talk about the Jews, have no longer prophets or miracles, traces of which to a considerable extent are still found among Christians, and some of them more remarkable than any that existed among the Jews. And these we ourselves have witnessed if our testimony may be received, end quote. And I could go on citing fathers throughout the first several hundred years of the church, like Hippolytus and Gregory Thamaturgus and Novitian and Cyprian and many others who told us in their writings that the gifts of the Spirit were ongoing. And really, up until this point, there is no debate about this. Even many cessationist teachers teach that the gifts of the Spirit were ongoing. And in fact, some cessationists 
believe that the gifts continued for quite some time after the apostles were gone. For example, William Winston says that the gifts didn't cease until the 4th century. And John Chapman says that they continued even into the 5th century. And by the way, that's right from Benjamin Warfield's book that we're going to talk about later. But these guys are saying that primarily because of the testimony of the church fathers themselves. Now, maybe you say, well, those patristic miracles weren't real miracles. That stuff was all fake. By the way, when we talk about patristic miracles, what we're talking about is the miracles of the church fathers. And that's what the word patristic means. And the authenticity of some of those patristic miracles is highly debated, as you'll see over the next couple of episodes. But that actually doesn't even matter. I'm not arguing for the veracity of those miracle claims. What I'm saying is that the church fathers claimed that those miracles were happening in their time. So even if every claim were false, if the church fathers believed and claimed that these miracles were ongoing, then they weren't cessationists, right? I mean, guys, this is not very difficult to follow. Once you start reading these accounts, it's undeniable. There were many fathers that believed that people were healing the sick in their day, casting out demons, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, prophesying and doing all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles in the name of Jesus. So here's the point that I'm making here. People who equate the church fathers with modern cessationism are either ignorant or dishonest or maybe a little bit of both. Now, we'll talk about some counterexamples in a minute, but there's something really, really important that happened along the way that we need to talk about for just a minute. Near the end of the second century, there was a movement that began called Montanism. And this group first called itself the New Prophecy because of the strong emphasis that they put on spirit-inspired speech, especially prophecy, and probably that included also speaking in tongues. And to be honest, the whole issue of Montanism is a bit of a slippery one because like any other movement, they probably had good and bad actors. There were some really amazing godly people that were involved. I'm sure there were also some crazy people and some frauds and who knows what else. And this was all obviously a very charismatic group and they experienced a lot of interesting, strange, probably even authentically supernatural and even miraculous things. But most of what we know about the Montanists comes from texts that were written by their enemies. So a lot of the information that we have about them is decidedly negative. Not all of it is negative, but a lot of it is. And in fact, a lot of people don't realize this, but initially the church actually approved of the Montanist movement. That's right. The Montanists were initially embraced by the church, but then they exploded with growth. And almost predictably, as that movement began to grow in influence and popularity, you see church officials beginning to oppose it and then denounce it as heresy, which obviously put a damper on things. But vestiges of the group continued to last even until the sixth century. But what you have to understand is that Montanists held basically to orthodox Christian doctrine. They weren't like this ancient version of the Jehovah's Witnesses or something. The real reason that they were criticized so much is because of the emphasis that they put on receiving personal prophetic revelations, also because of the peculiar way that they tended to manifest the Spirit. They were big on personal holiness and the second coming of Christ. And honestly, so far, this probably sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Holy Spirit, holiness, second coming, manifestations, almost sounds like modern Pentecostals and Charismatics, right? Another practice that was quite controversial was the liberty that Montanists gave to women to minister in the gifts of the Spirit in their gatherings. And again, this is also one of the characteristics, especially of the early Pentecostal movement as well. Now, one of Montanists' most influential and vocal critics in the church, a church father, was a guy by the name of Tertullian. Interestingly, though, Tertullian, a church father, ended up joining and becoming part of the Montanist movement himself. He wrote about that experience in the movement like this. He said, quote, we now have amongst us a sister whose lot it has been to be favored with sundry gifts of revelation, which she experiences in the spirit by ecstatic vision amidst the sacred rites of the Lord's day in the church. She converses with angels and sometimes even with the Lord. She both sees and hears mysterious communications. Some men's hearts she understands and to them who are in need, she distributes remedies whether it be in the reading of scriptures or in the chanting of psalms or in the preaching of sermons or in the offering up of prayers, 
in all these religious services, matter and opportunity are afforded to her of seeing visions. After the people are dismissed at the conclusion of the sacred services, she is in the regular habit of reporting to us whatever things she may have seen in vision, for all her communications are examined with the most scrupulous care in order that their truth may be probed, end quote. Does that sound like cessationism to you? <laughs> now, many church leaders during that time were opposed to Montanism. It's true. For example, Eusebius wrote, describing Montanus, it says that he became beside himself and being suddenly in a sort of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved and began to babble and utter strange things, prophesying in a manner contrary to the constant custom of the church handed down by tradition from the beginning, end quote. But Tertullian came to the defense of this behavior, and this is how he explained it. He said, quote, for when a man is wrapped in the spirit, especially when he beholds the glory of God or when God speaks through him, he necessarily loses his sensation because he is overshadowed with the power of God, end quote. It's also possible that Irenaeus was actually talking about the opponents of the Montanists when he rebuked them as those who, quote, set aside at once both the gospel and the prophetic spirit, end quote. It's also interesting to note that John Wesley, in his study of the Montanists, came to the conclusion that they were real scriptural Christians. Look what he wrote in one of his journals, quote, I was fully convinced of what I had once suspected. One, that the Montanists in the second and third centuries were real scriptural Christians. And two, that the grand reason why the miraculous gifts were so soon withdrawn was not only that faith and holiness were well nigh lost, but that dry, formal, orthodox men began even then to ridicule whatever gifts they had not themselves and to decry them all as either madness or imposture, end quote. And man, that is still so relevant to cessationism today, isn't it? Dry, formal, orthodox men, or at least those who pride themselves in their pristine orthodoxy, ridicule whatever gifts they don't have themselves, and they criticize everything that they can't do as either crazy or fake. Yep, basically the cessationist conference in a nutshell. And you know what? I think it's always going to be that way. Dry people will always criticize those on fire. People full of unbelief will always mock those with radical faith. Religious people are always going to condemn those with a vibrant relationship with God. Why? Because it exposes them. They feel embarrassed and convicted. But the reason this is important is because the Montanus controversy really seems to mark a shift in the church's broader thinking about the idea of the miraculous gifts. And there's probably several reasons for this, but there's one that's really significant. This is the first time that we see a kind of conflict between prophetic revelation and signs and wonders and miracles on the one hand and accepted biblical revelation and church tradition on the other. And that's a theme that is still very present in the modern cessationism debate, isn't it? And so, this was an important time in church history. And to complicate things even further, this was just about the time that the whole church was becoming more political and institutionalized. I mean, Constantine, who turned Christianity into a state-sponsored religion, converted like in the early fourth century. So all of this stuff is happening in just a couple hundred year time frame. And you know, whenever something becomes institutionalized, it's just part of life that all the spontaneity and creativity and spirit usually just gets organized right out of it. And especially things like prophecy and revelation and prophets and, you know, charismatic personalities and new movements and honestly even just fresh ideas are often seen as threatening to the institution. And, you know, most secular institutions, especially the commercial ones, they're forced to accept change because if they don't, they'll go out of business. But religious institutions are different. They seem to specialize in petrification. In fact, in some ways, especially in the modern world, people appreciate religious tradition precisely because it's old and it feels old. People like that feeling at certain times, like at weddings and funerals and Christmas time and Easter time. That's why Christmas is the most well-attended church service of the year, even by people that aren't Christians, because people want to feel that nostalgia. And that's not all bad. I, I think there should be something transcendent about the church. I don't think it's supposed to be updating every 12 hours like Microsoft Word or something. God isn't changing his mind based on the latest poll. What was true 2,000 years ago is still true today. And the church ought to stand on that rock of Christ's truth, no matter what society or culture says. 
And that's the part that should never change. But on the other hand, Christianity was never intended to be a monument to a dead God. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit is moving. Again, the gospel doesn't mean good history. It means good news. And that means that authentic Christianity is always going to have a kind of dynamic component to it. And that's always going to make some people uncomfortable. Richard Gaffin, who I'll remind you, is a cessationist, acknowledged this as well. He said, quote, the spirit is like the blowing wind, sovereign and ultimately incalculable. And any sound theology of the Holy Spirit, I take it, will be left with a certain remainder, a surplus unaccounted for, an area of mystery. The cessationist view that I hold is least of all driven by a rationalistic desire to have everything about the work of the Spirit tied up in a tidy, comfortable little package, end quote. Now, I appreciate that perspective coming from a cessationist like Gaffin, but I don't really think that everyone in his camp would agree. And even if they would say that they agree, the reality is that clearly prescribed liturgies and approved traditions and codified texts, this is what the formalized organization wants because these things keep everyone marching in lockstep and they keep people from going rogue, you know, like what happened in the Reformation. And, you know, human nature hasn't changed much over the last several thousand years. We can still relate to what happened in these early days of the church. It's not that difficult to understand why at the same time that the church is becoming this organized machine with career priests and bishops and big, beautiful, expensive buildings and councils, and there's political games going on behind the scenes and lots of money and power and influence on the line, you see a kind of resistance to unpredictable, charismatic stuff within the church. It would be strange if that weren't the case, right? So let's just be clear. Even though this is happening, even this kind of resistance was not some official position of the church that the gifts of the Spirit had ceased. So even then, we're not talking about something that looks like modern cessationism. And in fact, the gifts of the Spirit continue to manifest all throughout. We have record of this, maybe not so much at the top tier of church leadership, not the popes or the priests, but with the ascetics and monks and ordinary Christian people that probably didn't get a lot of attention. But we could talk about guys that were pretty well known, like Antony of the Desert and Pacomius and Hilarion and many, many others. But for the sake of time, Let's jump ahead to the 5th century to a guy that many of you Reformed cessationists will know and love, a guy by the name of Augustine. And Augustine seems to have been a bit of a cessationist early on in his life. He was pretty close-minded to the idea of signs and wonders and miracles, gifts of the Spirit. But then later on, as he got older and as he saw more things, he ended up changing his perspective. In his book, The City of God, he actually cites many examples of miracles that he personally witnessed. For example, a blind man in Milan was restored while Augustine was visiting the city, a miraculous healing that he says was, quote, witnessed by an immense concourse of people, end quote. And then in his writing, he goes on to give a list of healings of all kinds of ailments like gout and paralysis and hernia and blindness, demonic possession, insanity, several resurrections from the dead, and he ends the chapter by saying, quote, what am I to do? I'm so pressed by the promise of finishing this work that I cannot record all the miracles I know. And doubtless several of our adherents, when they read what I've narrated, will regret that I've omitted so many, which they as well as I certainly know. For were I to be silent of all others and to record exclusively the miracles of healing, which were wrought in the district of Calama and of Hippo, they would fill many volumes. And yet all, even of these could not be collected, but only those of which narratives have been written for public recital, end quote. So I want you to notice that we're now in the 5th century AD and we're still reading about signs and wonders and miracles. So many healings just in a couple of districts that they would fill many volumes. Does that sound like cessationism to you? Now, again, let me just reiterate this fundamental point before we move on. Let's look at this quote from Augustine about miracles. And this is from one of his earlier writings. So this is the kind of thing he would have said when he was more closed minded, more cessationist before he changed his mind, became much more open. Quote, I said, chapter 25, these miracles were not permitted to last till our times, lest the soul should always seek visible things and the human race should grow cold by becoming accustomed to things which stirred it when they were novel. 
That is true. When hands are laid on in baptism, people do not receive the Holy Spirit in such a way that they speak with the tongues of all the nations, nor are the sick now healed by the shadow of Christ's preachers as they pass by. Clearly such things, which happened then, have later ceased. But I should not be understood to mean that today no miracles are to be believed to happen in the name of Christ. For when I wrote that book, I myself had just heard that a blind man in Milan had received a sight beside the bodies of the Milanese martyrs, Pertasius and Gervasius, and many others happened even in these times, so that it is impossible to know them all or to enumerate those that we do know, end quote. So I want you to notice that even this more cessationist statement is not some kind of political, dogmatic, theological position. He's saying, look, people aren't speaking in the tongues of the nations like they did at Pentecost. Our shadows aren't healing the sick like they did with the apostles. Clearly, he says those things which happened then have later ceased. Okay, so he's making an observation. We aren't seeing certain things. And then he's trying to give us an explanation of why. He doesn't give any sort of doctrinal reason, not some systematic theological polemic. He doesn't turn to some proof text. He just says, here's the reality. Here's why I think it's like this. And that was his opinion. He was entitled to it. He saw the apostles' miracles as extraordinary. He felt like he wasn't seeing that stuff in his time. Fine. He's not making some polemical argument against the gifts. He's not condemning or rejecting the miracles that he does see happening. And in fact, he clarifies that he does not mean to say that miracles have ceased. These are happening all the time. Now, of course, he's attributing some of these miracles to shrines and relics, which I think we'd all agree is nonsense. He wasn't perfect. He was a human who made mistakes. But in no sense can it be said that he believed the way that modern cessationists do, even in his earlier, more cessationist phase of life. And that's how it is with these church fathers that are often considered to be cessationist. Sometimes their quote-unquote cessationism is just observational. They're just commenting on what they saw and what they experienced and what seemed to be the obvious reality in their time. Sometimes their, quote, cessationism was idealistic. It's like we talked about a few episodes ago where, you know, they had this highly romanticized idea of what the early church was like. And even though they were seeing miracles, the miracles that they were seeing didn't seem to measure up to their perceptions of what the early church was like. Or maybe their, quote, cessationism was actually like statements that were an indictment of the backslidden condition of the church. Like you don't have the power, you're not seeing miracles because you're not living right. You're not holy. You're not seeking the Lord. But what we never see in the church fathers is the cynical, dogmatic, polemical, total cessationism that's being taught today. Now, just to be fair, I would say that even today, not all cessationists are the John MacArthur, strange fire, cessationist conference types. Sometimes, even today, cessationists are just observational, like some of those early Christians were. They don't have any theological agenda. They don't have an ax to grind. They just don't see miracles happening. And they're saying, I don't see any miracles in operation. These are not the kind of cessationists that the series is about. Those people, those observational cessationists, they're misinformed. They're lacking in experience. And they are making a mistake in that they ought to be allowing the word of God to inform their worldview rather than allowing what they see around them to dictate their worldview. But regardless, this series is aimed at something else. The kind of cessationism that I'm calling heresy is something that grows on a totally different substrate, as you'll see in a moment. And to see where this kind of cessationism comes from, we need to fast forward in time to around the time of the Reformation. Now, as I already said, Catholics had no problem with miracles in principle. They certainly were not and are not Cessationist. So it's obvious that we find cessationism primarily within Protestant denominations. And within Protestantism, it's usually the Calvinists that seem to be the most dogmatically cessationist. And there's a good reason for this. There was actually a debate around miracles right at the heart of the Reformation drama. Because you see, one of the lines of reasoning was that if guys like Luther were truly sent from God, then they should have miracles to prove it. For example, Francis de Sales, who was the Bishop of Geneva, opposed the Reformation on the basis that they had no miracles to prove that their doctrine was from God. Now, I think it's hard for us to imagine how earth-shattering the Reformation was in its day. I mean, to many within the church, the Reformation would have felt like nothing less than the beginning of a totally new religion. 
And to those that were against the Reformation, like the sales, a few miracles of confirmation probably seemed like a reasonable expectation if that incredibly divisive movement were truly from God. Could it be that this is one of the primary reasons that the Reformers adopted a cessationist polemic in the first place? I mean, think about it. Cessationism is a pretty good defense in this situation, right? Somebody says, if you're from God, do a miracle and prove it. Well, since we can't do miracles, how about instead I give you a teaching showing you why God doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore? I mean, it is pragmatic, is it not? You cessationists, you have to at least acknowledge how convenient this was. It's not like Calvin was just reading his Bible one day and he became convinced by the biblical evidence that Miracles had ceased, and he just felt a burden from the Lord to see this glorious truth rediscovered by a new generation of Christians. No, actually, he had a pretty obvious motive for his cessationism. It's kind of like this new trend of gay theologians that have, for the first time in history, discovered that the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality after all. I mean, what are the odds? I bet their hermeneutics have nothing to do with their ulterior motives. It's just a total coincidence that they stumbled upon this epiphany. It's all just too convenient, if you ask me. But it should be noted that Calvinists today have even out-Calvined Calvin. And that's the case in many areas, but especially and including this area of cessationism. You know, there's an excellent book that's written by Dr. John Ruffin called On the Cessation of the Charismata. And I'm going to be referring to this quite a bit over the next few episodes. But Ruffin says, quote, Calvin popularized the restriction of miracles to the accreditation of the apostles and specifically to their writings, though he was less rigid about cessationism than many of his followers in that he held to the tradition that in unevangelized areas, apostles and prophetic gifts could reoccur to confirm the gospel, end quote. So again, Calvin was less cessationist than most modern day Calvinists are. And by the way, that's just kind of how it goes, right? Ideas tend to become more radical over time. What started out as a soft observational kind of cessationism in earlier times became formalized and polemicized by thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and then adopted and codified by guys like John Calvin. And then so in Protestant circles, with very few exceptions, cessationism was by and large the default position. One historian said, quote, the Reformation was created and pervaded by the modern spirit and its leaders were compelled by the exigencies of their position to repudiate the miraculous accounts of their time, we find accordingly that from the very beginning, Protestantism looked upon modern miracles with an aversion and distrust, end quote. Now, let me just say something at this point, because I've been calling this series the heresy of cessationism. But just for the record, I'm not saying that I think that anything that we've talked about so far is heretical. And in fact, even The reformers themselves, as you can see here, are still quite open-minded compared to what modern cessationists believe. For example, Luther once advised a friend who wrote him requesting help with a mentally ill man by telling that man to pray for him according to James 5.15. Luther said, quote, this is what we do and that we have been accustomed to do for a cabinet maker here was similarly afflicted and we cured him by prayer in Christ's name, end quote. I'm sure you've heard the famous hymn, A mighty fortress is our God. Well, you know that Martin Luther wrote that, right? And you know how in this, I don't know if it's the third or fourth verse, he wrote, the spirit and gifts are ours. Now, did he really mean that? I mean, he didn't qualify that statement. Maybe it just didn't sound as good to sing. The spirit and non-miraculous gifts are ours. I can imagine that would have been a very long phrase in German. In his 95 Theses, if you look at the 78th point, it actually says that the Pope has at his disposal the graces and spiritual powers and gifts of healings and so on. And then he refers to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which talks about gifts of apostles, prophets, and teachers, and miracles, and healings, and even tongues. Now, regardless of what you think about the Pope, if Luther thought that the Pope had gifts of the Spirit at his disposal— then Luther wasn't as cessationist as modern cessationists are, at least not when he wrote that. Now, here's a really interesting one. Let's talk about John Calvin for a minute. This is going to be controversial, okay? But it is possible that John Calvin might have actually experienced glossolalia, speaking in tongues. Theodore Beza, who succeeded Calvin as the leader of the Reformation in Geneva, 
recorded the incident in Davidum Johannes Calvin, The Life of John Calvin. And in 1975, seminary students Quint Warford and Ken McCary translated Bez's comments about Calvin's experiences. Warford then wrote an article in the student newspaper of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he quotes Beza's record of the incidents. And Warford admitted that he found it preposterous that Calvin spoke in tongues, but he found Beza's short entry that said that Calvin, during his devotions on several occasions, began speaking in a lingua non nata e cognata mihi, a language not known or understood by him. And this was significant because Calvin was actually a linguist, and he was interested in identifying the language for linguistic purposes. According to Warford, Calvin couldn't trace the language, although he thought it was Hebraic in character, and he feared that his utterance was a lingua barbarorum, an accursed tongue, possibly an ancient Canaanite dialect. Isn't that interesting? Now, I think I need to just clarify that, although I have found quite a few references to this paper, I wasn't actually able to get my hands on either the full paper or the original source in time for this recording. And I looked in my English translation of the life of John Calvin. I couldn't find this personally. So again, I cannot independently verify that this is legit, but either way, Calvin was definitely a cessationist. I'm not denying that whatsoever, but on the other hand, as I've already mentioned, he still wasn't as dogmatic as modern cessationists are. Calvin was actually open to the idea that the apostolic and prophetic gifts might reemerge if necessary, saying that the Lord, quote, now and again revives them as the need of the times demands, end quote. And again, in the second volume of Institutes, where he's talking about Ephesians 4.11, and especially prophets, he says, quote, this class either does not exist today or is less commonly seen. Huldrych Zwingli was the other major leader of the Reformation. And I'll just read what the Reformed author Mark Ellenson says. He says, quote, Zwingli claimed that the gift of tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was ordained by Christ for the benefit of providing a witness to unbelievers. Just as water baptism provides a testimony of faith to others, glossolalia, the experience of speaking in tongues, he insisted, is not necessary for salvation, as it was only given to a few. It is, though, a miracle on baptism. The Zwinglian tradition is obviously friendly to the subsequent development of Pentecostalism, end quote. Now, just to be clear, once again, I am not claiming that Luther or Zwingli or Calvin were continuationists. They certainly were not, and I would never want to misrepresent what they believed. But at the same time, you can clearly see that these reformers, even though they were cessationist, were still less dogmatic than most modern day cessationists are, who have committed to their cessationism with a religious zeal. So how did we get from the cessationism of Calvin to what modern cessationists believe and teach. Well, this is where it gets really interesting, but unfortunately, I don't think we have time to delve into this today. So we're gonna have to wait to the next episode, but look, this is going to be super fascinating. And so I wanna just encourage you, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video. I don't want you to miss a single episode of what's coming up on Daniel Kalenda Off the Record.